Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, April Fool's Day, and Easter Sunday, 2018. This is episode 1476. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Flexible and entertaining training for your IT career. Visit itpro.tv slash techguy and use the code TG30 to get a free seven-day trial and 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by LastPass. Join the over 13 million LastPass users and start managing and securing your passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Happy Easter. Happy April Fool's Day. This is the show where we talk about tech, Easter eggs, and April Fool's. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the number, 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Yeah, the show's live. I'm here today, and I hope you'll uh, you'll join me with your calls and questions. It should be a good day to get in, usually on holidays. There are not as many people trying to get in, busy people doing uh, Easter egg hunts and church and stuff so this would be a good time to call 888-827-5536 toll free from anywhere in the u.s or canada we talk about uh you know anything with a chip in it, anything having to do with computers technology the internet programming computer programming yeah we sometimes talk about that uh internet technology stuff <laughs> Home theater, which are sure, yeah, big screen TVs, talk about that. Smartphones, of course, the computer that uh, you use more than any other, probably. Smart watches, the computer you use less than any other, probably. Augmented reality, virtual reality. I saw, speaking of virtual reality, the geek movie of the year. Well, at least until uh, Star Wars comes out. Uh, that's Ready Player One, just came out this weekend. Steven Spielberg did it. And that uh, it is, it's fun because, because uh, it, it, you know, fun for a lot of 80s nostalgia buffs. People who grew up in the 80s will enjoy all the references and it's chock a block with them. But fun also because it's about a near future where I think 2045, something like that, 20 years from now, when uh, virtual reality is so commonplace that everybody does it at least some, a little bit a day during the day. And uh, it's it's a uh, it's a fun envisioning of what VR will be like. Probably nothing like what it will be like, but but a fun envisioning. Some of the technology, in fact, most of the technology does exist. I I'm, I won't give you any spoilers. I promise. I'm not uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Just about the technology involved. Uh, the star of, of the movie and most of the characters in the movie spend a lot of time in VR. About half the movie's animated. Uh, but it, they wear something that looks a little bit like a you know a small version of the VR visor that we see today, the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive. It uh, it's it's it, when he gets an upgrade, it's a little clearer. You can see through it, so it might be a little bit more augmented plus virtual reality. I'm not sure. It's hard to tell. Seems like pure virtual reality. That is where you don't see what's around you. You only see the world you're in. There's, it also has, uh, you know, has to solve one of the biggest problems with virtual reality. Well, there's two. <laughs> one is that makes people nauseous. <laughs> that's uh, that's actually, I think, probably the most serious problem with VR, and may never be solved. The idea, and the reason is, the human body is not designed to see one thing and feel another. Your brain, when you when you when your when your eyes tell you one thing but your body tells you something else that's when you get nauseated and the, your brain and the reason you get nauseated I'm, we're told by evolutionary biologists is well this is a actually a survival mechanism the brain when it gets in a situation that a nose can't be real says oh boy <laughs> you must have eaten some bad mushrooms <laughs> we better throw up now <laughs> communication to the stomach uh, 
And so I'm told that's that's the at least the theory why why this nauseates people. And uh, that's going to be hard to fix until we can really connect directly into the brain so that the brain isn't confused. The brain says, yeah, this is exactly what's happening. Right now, though, uh, your, your body knows you're not in this world. Your inner ear knows you're not. And uh, your eyes are telling you all sorts of weird things because your eyes are focusing on a screen that's an inch or two from your eyeballs, right? That's the VR helmet. But your that's where they're converging, I guess. But they're focusing. They're attempting to see something much more distant. Boy, that's a big signal to the brain that something's gone wrong. Your eyes are converging at one point and focusing at another point. Oh, that's a bad thing. It's one of the reasons I think 3D has kind of been a flop. So VR has got to solve that problem. The other problem, which is a big problem if you've used any of these, and I have both of them, and I, the Rift and the Vive, and I've played a lot of games in them, is moving around is hard because you're, you're tethered to a computer. You can go to an amusement park. There are virtual reality experiences where you walk around. Uh, and, but they, that's a big deal. You have to build a whole thing that people can walk safely, by the way, walk around in. So the way it works when you're in your home VR system is uh, you it often will have, a, you have a, a, a trigger, a little joystick controller that you point where you want to go, press the button, and you go, whoop, you go over there. You zip, <laughs> you zip right over to that. That's not realistic. So in the movie, and, and by the way, these things exist. There's, I, we did an interview with a company called Infinidec that makes this. It's a multi-directional treadmill. So you stand on it, and you can walk on any direction, and the platform will move. So you can you can walk. You can even run the Infinidec, uh, which I think I'm told inspired the Infinidec in the movies. The Infinidec lets you run as fast as seven or eight miles an hour. It sounds like a herd of elephants. Because imagine all the machinery involved. You're wearing sensors on your feet. It's it's you're wearing I mean sensors everywhere, and of course it has to have a railing all the way around it so you don't run off the darn thing and hurt yourself. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like in the movie initially. Although there seem to be other technologies in the movie. At another point, there's something a little more flexible. I won't talk about it because I don't want to spoil anything. And then you have the sensory issue because. You, you see stuff, but that's only one of your five senses. What about touch and smell and taste? And so, you and he, you know, hearing, he, I guess hearing and sight you can do, right? You got headphones and you got visor. Touch is the big one. So they have these uh, sensor suits, sensor suits that you wear. And uh, you can feel things. Pleasant and unpleasant, by the way. <laughs> Again, no spoilers, but you'll see in the movie they, they demonstrate both. Uh, the, I, I gather from the movie that the idea of the visor is you're not looking at a screen, but lasers are or lasers. They're, why is it when science fiction, when we need something you know, really different, new, and clever, we say lasers are involved. Lasers beam directly into your retinas, the images you're seeing. Similar technologies uh, do, believe it or not, sort of kind of exist. So the movie isn't all that far-fetched, but it's a heck of a good movie. And it's a Spielberg movie, and it has lots of Spielberg elements. And if you were alive during the 80s, you, you will see many old friends in many, many guises. Really fun, a lot of fun. And uh, See it, in, if you can, in an Atmos theater. So you get the full surround sound effect. Dolby Atmos really does sound good. Uh, I did not see it in 3D. It is available in 3D. I am no inclination to see it in 3D, although our home theater guru uh, yesterday said, uh, Scott Wilkinson said, it's pretty good in 3D because there's so many 3D experiences in the movie. That's true. But it was not, interestingly, shot in 3D. It wasn't in many parts of it. It wasn't even shot in digital. It was shot 35 millimeter film. What? Spielberg's an old, old, uh, uh, how do we put this? <laughs> he likes the tried and true. <laughs> uh, and and I, another thing I did not know, but Scott Wilkinson told me, is that the computer graphics are not 4K, they're 1080p. They're high def, not ultra high def. And that's always the case. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. 
Anyway, a, a lot of fun. It is April Fool's. I am pleased to say there are not many April Fool's jokes in the news cycle, thank goodness. But there are a few that seem like April Fool's jokes that aren't. We'll talk about those and what Google did, because Google, you know, loves April Fool's Day. We'll talk about all that and Easter eggs, too. Actually, it's fun because the, the movie Ready Player One uh, kind of revolves around an Easter egg. Kind of fun. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, Kim Schaffer at the helm. She's answering the phones. Give her a ring. Mike Cosio will be playing some fun music, probably 80s music today. <laughs> we'll get to the phone calls right after this. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK, Leo, the phone number. When you call that number, you'll talk to the Easter egg clad. <laughs> a little bit. Yep. Kim Schaffer. She kind of looks like a... Paisley, a Paisley Easter Bunny. Easter egg. Yep. Hello, Kim Schaffer. Hi. Happy Easter and happy April Fools. Has anyone punked you today? Yeah, I woke up to a text message this morning um, that the restaurant I was at last night uh, had a grease fire in the kitchen. <laughs> That's not nice. And I looked at the front page of the newspaper and there was nothing there. So I went That's out. That's not nice. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> I like funny jokes. You know, yeah. Google in years past has spent, you know, a lot of money and energy. You often felt like, gosh, I bet a third of the staff was working on this all year long on right. Easter I mean April Fool's jokes, uh, but I, I don't I don't know if they there's one in uh, Google Maps. Which yeah, is fun. where's Waldo? Did you get that one? I did. I was I'm playing right now. <laughs> so you if you enter a, a location, you just click on Google Maps and it'll just Waldo's start up. on the side, and you click on him, and and then it'll start up. Oh, fun! And and it's a game. You're like looking for yeah, Waldo. Yeah, it's just like the book. You're <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's easy. That's I got fun. through five levels and I quit. Wow, that's a lot of. Wa oh, I see Waldo. I see him right there. He's just waving at you on the side. Yeah. There. Yeah. So what you tap him? Tap him. Says, "Where's Waldo? Okay. Waldo invited you on an April Fool's world tour. He shared his location and maps, but he's hiding in a crowd. Find him and his friends as they travel around the world. Uh, he's somewhere. I don't know where. Near Aconcagua. Aconcagua." <laughs> Start game. Oh, he's in the Andes in Chile. Wow. And then so there's a where Where's Waldo picture. Ooh, and you can scroll around in it, and you find him, huh? Yep. He's there <sighs> somewhere. The first one's super easy. Nope. Not, you're not that the only him? one to fall for that trap, it says. <laughs> oh, it's somebody who's wearing a striped shirt. I found Wenda. <laughs> who's Wenda? <laughs> Waldo's wife. Oh, there's several in here? This is I don't I'm still playing I guess because Wenda isn't Waldo. All right. <laughs> well, I've just wasted enough of your time. Who should I talk to? Um, <laughs> Who should I talk to? How about uh, uh, Gary in Ontario, California? All right. Looks like he's having trouble getting his mail on. His I phone. love it. I am just glad. I thought no one would call on this Easter Sunday, so I'm I got glad. Got a few, so yeah. let's let's keep it going. Hi, Gary Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Gary. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Welcome. Happy Easter. Happy April Fool's Day. Welcome to the Tech yep. Guy Show. Same to you. Long Thank time you. listener. Thank you. Um, my issue is um, I had to replace my wife's phone with the same phone at Apple. And in the process of setting up mail and everything, we realized she was not getting her email until she actually opened up the mail app and the mail would download. So I fooled with, uh, you know, all the things I could find on Google and come to find out that push does not work for anything. And at the point I was doing, I couldn't even get iCloud. To let me, let me stop you for a second. What uh, mail app is she using, Apple's or somebody else's? Apple's. Okay. So her push is not, yeah, so other mail apps won't work that way in the background generally because Apple doesn't like programs running in the background that's one way they get great battery life is they're very restrictive right. about what can run in the background apple stuff will but not other stuff so apple mail does run in the background and yeah you're right it's push which means so there's there's two directions you can go push and pull so traditional email is polling email and that's still working for her when she opens the email client it polls the email server asks it you got anything for me and it sends it Push is the opposite direction, where you're just walking along day to day, doing your daily thing, and the email server gets an email message for you, and it pushes it to your phone. 
And, and right. you're right. Push is fairly important. Push is how text messaging works, right? You don't have to go check to see if you got a text message. It just comes in. Does she get text that's, messages? That's the problem. Well, what I finally ended up doing is forwarding uh, her. Our business has, you know, their own email, so I forward that into iCloud, and that solved the problem. And I just was wondering if Apple was going to ever fix it. So I guess now, what, now, I'm, conf- I'm, now I'm really confused. So. You said other things push wasn't working. What wasn't besides email? Was well, there? I have my my own domain, and then I have G, a Gmail. A couple. Oh, of I see. Addresses. You just weren't getting any email pushed to you. Yeah, got it. Other one. Right. But then, somehow but I'm then mad. you triggered it somehow by forwarding business email into the iCloud, and now it's working okay. It's working great. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And I, I just had to make sure that when she sent an email. That it would, or reply to an email that it would reply to her independent electronics, uh, e- you know, mail rather than going to iCloud, and that seems to work so far. It it it, uh, it was like a day project to get all that stuff. No working. kidding, and I don't yeah. know how. Uh, that's a strange thing. Um, is her main email a Gmail account? Well, my main one is my own domain, independentelectronics.com, and it's hosted by, it was hosted by Verizon years ago, but it's some, you know, they've sold it off. Yeah, that was Yahoo. So now, but the email that wasn't pushing, what kind of, what was the, who was the, you know, email provider? Was it Gmail? Well, Gmail wouldn't either. Uh, I, we have to, you have to open up the mail app, and, yes. and then you'd get your mail, like you said, it would, it would pull. Yes. Um, so I, there has been, there have been problems in the past is why I'm asking with Gmail push. Right. I read about that. Right. Yeah. Supposedly it works now, but it, uh, it, so far I haven't been able to get it to work. So, um, you go into the Gmail account and you've already looked at this setting and made sure, and you know, they, they, one of the suggestions is you turn on fetch but you really fetch, which is the same thing as as poll. I I just used a older yeah, term. You don't is, really right. want fetch. You really want push. Well, you're kind of stuck. All my addresses, once I go in there and look at them, my independent, my Gmail, and all of them, all are fetch, and they're set automatic, or at least at this point. Yeah. So iOS has fetch methods and push methods. Right. Yeah. Um, and iOS can be set to automatically fetch in the background. It's a little different than push. I prefer push. In general, you want pushing because that yeah. way your your phone doesn't have to go out and every, you know, in the old email days, remember it would go every 10, you say, how often do you want to check your email? Every 10 minutes, check the email. Check the email, check the email. That's a waste of battery because it wakes up the phone. The phone has to get going, fire it up and go get the mail. And if there's no mail, nothing happens, but it still uses battery. Whereas push you know, it doesn't have to do anything. The mail just arrives, pushed to it. Saves a lot of battery life. I'm not sure why it was broken. I'm glad you found something and fixed it. It sounds like her account's the problem. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, this is interesting. Aaron K. Max says, it's a Gmail issue unless you have the paid G Suite account, which I bet your work does. You can't configure for push anymore in the free accounts. That's interesting. So that's a... That's a change in Gmail, I guess. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Another song from uh, the Ready Player One generation. Mentioned in the uh, book. I don't remember it mentioned in the movie. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Call uh, via Skype outside that area. It should still be toll free. David on the line from Austin, Texas. Hi, David. Uh, hey, Leo. Welcome. What can I do for you? Let me switch from my Bluetooth headset to my iPhone. Okay. Um, this is my first time ever I'm making a call to a radio station, to a net program, so <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I'm trying to make it quick. <laughs> you know, I think I've only done it in my whole life. I've only done, I've worked in talk radio for 40 years, but I think I've only done it once myself. I know. It's a little nerve-wracking. It's funny because I'd been working in radio for years, and I, I called a radio show once, and it was terrifying. <laughs> So yeah, I, I have to my mind off of it. I was, I was, you know, <laughs> no, you know here, here's the good news. No one's listening, David. It's just you and yeah, me. It's, it's pretty cool because it's crazy. I, I was doing yard work, and I put, put you into Siri. I added you to my contact so I could tell Siri, call as I was weed eating. The first time I said, Siri, call Leo, 
it went through. What? Crazy. Anyway. What? Wow. <laughs> so that's, that's good. The to getting a hold of you. That's good. Siri knows the so, special back door, I guess. Yeah. So, Leo, let me see if I can give you a. So this is kind of a specific, maybe techie type stuff. All right. Uh, and I have a couple of other questions that are general that might be helpful to other people. Okay. Uh, so I want to, I, I work, you know, we have, I work with a small company, 10 people, and we use Dropbox as our network. That's how we share files. Yeah. A lot of people the do. Problem, it's very, very the problem popular. with that, though, is we're getting conflicts and there are certain files that, can, you know, we have some access databases I will not yeah, that. you know, da this is a problem with databases. If you right. have a, two programs accessing the same file at once, you're going to have problems. Right, right, which I've kind of encountered. Yeah. What I wanted to do was set up a VPN, and I'm trying to figure out, I tried, I was able to configure Hamachi and, you know, install the things and get, you know, there's some settings where... This isn't going to fix the fundamental problem, you understand. Right, but the, no, but I mean, putting the server on a file share, I mean, putting it on a file share. It's not going to solve I, the problem. Right, right. But, well, no, I, then I'm not sure. No, but I'm not asking the Dropbox. The, the network, the VPN is for two people in remote locations. So I was going to put the file off of the server in one, like on a Windows it's server, and then people are going to access it. But I just need to It's not going to gonna solve the problem. Okay, I'm not sure I... Uh, the problem is, doesn't matter how it's stored or whether it's VPN or Hamachi, if you've got two people accessing the same file... No, but access does allow you... It has to support locking. It has to support locking, yes, record does. locking. Microsoft does. Microsoft <clears throat> does. Microsoft access does. Well, then it would work on Dropbox. No, because Dropbox sees each person's... No, because when you're accessing Dropbox, you're accessing it on your PC. When you're accessing oh, it on yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying. They're accessing it locally. You're right. If you Correct. have it on a central server, I got it. If you have it on a central server, uh, access is file locking will work. So right. any program that's designed to be multi-user has to be very careful about two people accessing the file at the same time. So right. the way it'll work in a mean, database program is they'll lock the record down that's being uh, edited until uh, that person releases it. Yeah. Right. At some point, I'm looking at going to SQL Server. and Yeah, you know, you'd, not... you'd be much better off with a database designed for this. Access is right. notoriously problematic. But but right. you're right. You did. I apologize. You did solve the initial problem because Dropbox isn't a single source of information. It's not one file. It's two different files, one on each computer, and that's never going to work. Right. Yeah. Now, it became, and the problem is, I guess I could access a Dropbox if they were at the same location, but then I'm throwing stuff out. But the VPN part is so the Hamachi works, and you know. But I just wanted to see if you could recommend a Hamachi, you know, whatever that. Uh, I wouldn't do Hamachi. What Hamachi tricks the network into looking like a local network, and that while it's very cool, uh, it probably isn't the way to solve this problem. You really want to do it. If I mean, this is a business production app right this is not right and it, it's not yeah, a hobby I mean, the only thing is, right you don't want to you don't want to just for instance do this wrong and the entire database gets corrupted right and that's not it's good low usage <laughs> it's low usage database so i think we could i mean if nothing else i'll try it out but i mean could would an open vpn no um, what you want is a file server and you want a file server uh that is accessible any network attached storage solution, we call them NASs, N-A-S, will do right. this. You just, it, with a NAS, you're going to be using Microsoft's uh, file sharing technology over the internet. You don't need a VPN. You're trying to basically trick it into thinking it's local when That's it's correct. not. Right. What you want is a solution that handles file sharing appropriately using the te technology Microsoft provides to do exactly this. Uh, you still may have problems with access because access isn't, but it's supposed to work, but it's notoriously bad for multi-user. So eventually you're probably going to go to <clears throat> some sort okay. of SQL Wait. solution, but, but nevertheless, okay. what you want is a network attached store. This You need this for your business anyway. A network attached storage server. It becomes a file server and the file sits on that and is accessible both locally over the network and uh, over uh, the internet. And that you may want to use a VPN for privacy. Uh, but a good NAS will provide the VPN as well. So your NAS, you'll be logging into the VPN server and uh, and using the file as if it's local. 
even if you are off-site. So that's a really good solution. Uh, Synology makes excellent NASes. That's the one I use, and they will okay. do all of this. So I basically, do recommend Synology. Yeah. Is there, I mean, if I need a, do they have like a basic setup that doesn't, you know, require, you know, I'm not hosting, you know, multimedia files. I'm basically yeah. You can file so the way it. the way Synology works is you get the same software on all of their NASes. It's the price is determined by how many drives are in it, and I think given that this is a, a business database and you know data corruption is an issue, you'd probably want a two drive at least two drive Synology NAS. Uh, okay, that's for redundancy. And, uh, and you probably, you know, what you would really like to do is have an off-site copy of the NAS software. Right. right? And, and I'm familiar with that. I have yeah. a Western digital, I, I have All a Western right. digital NAS that you told me not to, that you told somebody else. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm idea. not a fan, but it's the same right. idea. And then, uh, I, th I think you'd be fine. Now the, the trick of course is going to be the person who's off-site and that is where you want to use a VPN because you want it in the traffic encrypted. Uh, that's how VPNs started as businesses wanted their employees to right, be able to right. log in locally, remotely. And so that's that's the good solution. And a good NAS will have that. Synology has that capability built in. Um, but I would do you have somebody who runs your uh, your business network, your office network, an well, IT we, guy? Uh, I am the IT guy. That's what I thought. <laughs> Uh, that's I mean, I'm I a thought. developer, <laughs> IT guy. So you get to do it all. <laughs> right. So you want, you're going to have to, uh, I presume you have some sort of protection, a firewall protection on your network, your uh, corporate network, business network. Yes. You're going to have to probably put the VPN at that firewall. So whatever you're using for protection, uh, you're going to want to see if that supports a VPN that the, uh, the, the off-site employees can access. They'd log in using their... The good news is all computer software, all operating systems now come with VPN, so it's a very simple thing for them to log in. They'll log into that VPN at the edge, right? That's where that's where they're going to log in. That's where your router is at the edge. That puts them in the corporate network. And then your Synology NAS or whatever NAS you're using is a file share on the corporate network that everybody can see at every desk if, if you give them permission to. And the VPN remote user can log in through the VPN to that NAS. And that's the best way to do that. Well, uh, you know, because we don't, I mean, we're a fairly small organization. We're 10 people, so we don't have, you know, uh, like we don't have a separate fire. We, we use an Asus router. Okay, uh, as that's fine. Um, Asus, check with that Asus router, see if it supports VPN. Most routers do now, even consumer routers. If not, you might want to get one that's a little bit more beefy. Um, you know, we, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not much bigger than you, but we have, believe me, we have all sorts of intrusion detection and, and uh, sophisticated firewalls between us and the outside world. You just have to these days. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You can actually get a, uh, a Synology Na uh, uh, NAS router. Synology makes excellent routers. So that would be another another choice for you. But look and see first if that Asus that you have has VPN. Many Asus okay. Asuses do if it's a late model Asus. Um, yeah, it is a late model. I, I had a couple of general purposes. Sure. I don't know. If you, sure. Does that all make sense, though? Does that, yeah, no, no, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, I, I, that's I, the best I, way to do it. This. Yeah, Hamachi uh, is not a good idea because now that it's it, you'd be much better off doing a VPN to your business, you know, to the edge of the business, and then using a NAS or some other file sharing system inside the business to make the file available. Okay. And that solves a lot of other problems. If this is, you know, it's worth doing it right because then you have more protection and more flexibility down the road. Yeah. I mean, if, uh, you know, I, I purchased a, you know, I figured, uh, like, I have a second office that I purchased, like, like a Netgear router. Yep. The Asus work has an open VPN, uh, VPN in part, as part of the... Perfect. Router. This Netgear had a kind of a very slim pickings with his open VPN stuff. Right. It was, you know, so it kind of was useless. Take a look at the what Synology. The Synology NAS is right, right, excellent. Right. And it's a, a not NAS, a uh, router is excellent. And it's a, right. it's I, kind I of, it's kind of midway between a consumer router and a business router. It's got a lot of nice features and that would work perfectly well with this uh, uh, environment. Okay. I do have a couple of quick generic I mean. Sure, go ahead. So, um, over the last year or so, I've been buying a couple laptops with touch. And on one of the, on one of the Lenovo's I bought, a Yoga, it, uh, we had to turn off the touch feature 
because it was doing phantom touching and ghost touching or whatever. Yeah, I have a Lenovo Yoga. It does not do that. That's something wrong with the Yoga. Unless well, well, it's the it could be the trackpad. You're not you're not you make sure the trackpad's turning off when you're typing. Yeah, I mean, I've had two like I like with my I have an Acer that also does that, and it seems like it. I don't know. I, I thought maybe it was a Windows update because sometimes it would come and go. No, I have a million. I have at least a half dozen Windows machines with touch. None of them have any phantom okay. touch issues. No, that, that's fine. I just wanted because I hadn't been able to find information about. Yeah, that. I don't know. I don't know what that's coming yeah. from. I would take a look certainly at the touchpad. Okay. Uh, make sure that's being dis. You know, look in the settings. Make sure that's being disabled while you're uh, typing. Okay, it's pretty crazy. You talking back to me, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fun. I'm glad you called. You kept me company. I, I, I was in Germany, I don't know, five or six years ago for about uh, eight months. And your podcast, this was before the, you know, smartphones came out to some degree, right around the time. I was going to say, I had you on my iPod. That's nice. Thank oh, you. Okay. <laughs> hey, one thing the chat room is suggesting, and I think this is true more and more, uh, instead of running a, a server locally, you could also uh, use Microsoft's cloud services. Yeah. We have some sensitive data. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then all the more counter. reason you want to do this right. <laughs> right. And that kind of goes counter to what you're saying about you need professional you know, protection, which is not what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's all the more reason. You might actually be safer in Azure than you would be if you don't have a well-secured uh, environment at work. But nevertheless... <laughs> Uh, I, mean, I, it, saw that. I saw that. I saw. Yeah, I think I, you could. I, I, you could trust Azure. I mean, I, you know, it, what you're want, going to want. I don't know what business you're in, but you're going to want something that's uh, compliant with whatever privacy regulations are current in your business. Uh, you know, there's there's financial services recommend uh, re requirements. There's HIPAA, of course, for medical providers, and Microsoft offers compliant storage in all those situations. So that's what you want. Is something that's. Uh, HIPAA compliant or uh, PCI compliant or whatever it is, whatever regulations your industry needs. And I, I think Microsoft especially uh, is very sensitive to these uh, issues and will do a good job protecting your data. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO. It's an interesting world we're living in, really in the middle right now uh, of a transition. And you're actually seeing this at Microsoft. You saw that this week at Microsoft. A transition from doing everything locally, like our last caller who wanted to file server in his office and allowing his employees to log in remotely to use the file server. That's kind of the old school way. And more and more, and I'm sure you're aware of this, he was kind of trying to bridge the gap with Dropbox, right? More and more we're seeing that with cloud services. Chatroom uh, said, and I completely agree with him, that, uh, agree with him, that the, probably the best thing for the caller would be to call his Microsoft rep and say, I want Azure in the cloud. I want cloud services. I want to put my access database in the cloud, have a multi-user set up. Uh, it would be secure, probably more secure, <laughs> frankly, than his office is, given that he's using a consumer-grade router for, uh, for his firewall protection and tried to use Dropbox for file sharing. You should probably know if privacy is an issue for you, uh, the cloud providers like Microsoft's OneDrive and Dropbox, Apple's iCloud, none of them are compliant with things like the HIPAA regulation because in every case, the company has access to that data. So a rogue employee at Dropbox or Apple or Microsoft could see that data. And that's, of course, a privacy issue. You can, though, get... HIPAA compliant storage or PCI compliant or storage is compliant with whatever technologies and security required by your industry from Microsoft and other companies. You just have to call them and say, this is what I need and I need it to be private and secure and I don't want you to have the keys. I don't want anybody to have the keys except, you know, duly designated employees. And you can do that. And it would be a lot simpler and frankly, probably a lot more secure. I know we talk a lot about data breaches and data loss and so forth. Uh, there was just another one at my fitness pal, which is run by Under Armour, and uh, I got an email. You probably did too, if you've ever used my fitness pal, saying, "Oh well, sorry, <laughs> whoops, whoopsies." <laughs> but that's those are big uh, online public databases, a little easier to hack, and uh, and certainly a better target, a, a, a much more uh, interesting target for bad guys than your particular application so i think i think you'd be a lot a lot better off 
um, talking to Microsoft. And they may even steer you away from access to SQL Server, a uh, somewhat more powerful Microsoft solution for this kind of multi-user environment. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Back to the phones we go. Line 2, Kenny, Kansas City, Missouri. Hello, Kenny. Hello, how are you doing? I'm well, how are you? Doing good. What's up? Happy Easter? Um, happy April Fool's? Happy yep. um, I bought a, uh, or look, look at buying a router, and I can't remember the company who makes it. It's called an, uh, something Archer 9. Yes, that's the TP-Link. Oh, okay, TP-Link. Okay. Yeah. And I want to know if that was a... Yeah, the Archers are very good. Uh, in fact, for a long time, the wire cutter, which is one of the places I really like to refer people to for things like router recommendations, they're run by the New York Times, but they were started by a friend, uh, Brian Lamb, who used to work at Gizmodo, and the whole idea was, Brian said, you know, we always give these reviews and you say there's 15 different appropriate things for this particular use. What if we did a review site that just said, this is the one to get? This is the one you should get. And that the wire cutter was born, and, and they've really grown. And they one of the things I like about them, they're one of the last technology publications that does extensive testing. They use experts and they test them all. And so they don't, uh, uh, unfortunately, they they don't they stop re recommending the TP Link. I don't think because there's anything wrong with it. They used to like the Archer C7, um, but they are always testing. Now they recommend the Nighthawk, the Netgear Nighthawk R7000P uh, as their pick. Doesn't mean that that's not a great that Archer is not a great router. It is TP Link makes very nice stuff, affordable stuff. That I mean, that was one of the reasons they picked it is the price was right. Um, it's a, de a decent, <laughs> a good selection, shall we say? <laughs> uh, I have my favorites, and nowadays I'm really kind of fond of the mesh uh, systems because they just seem to solve a lot of problems people have with Wi-Fi. Um, but you know, different different uh, routers for different people depends what you need uh let's see let's take a little break and then we'll come back and we'll talk more about tech with you at 8888 ask leo don't forget the website is techilabs.com that's where you can get all the answers to all the questions and uh, links and even if you're yelling at the radio saying i got an idea you can even put your ideas up there your comments are more than welcome and it's free techguylabs.com todd he's next palmdale california hello todd Yes, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. What can I do for you, sir? Yes, uh, I had a friend, and then five years ago, she had a device for her, her home phone, and it was a, uh, I don't know what it did, but it made it, it made it mobile. She could go out throughout her, our town and use it. Yeah, no, there's <laughs> no good way to do that. You can do it the other direction. Maybe that's what she was doing. Because if you have a cell phone, there are many devices that turn that cell phone into your home phone. Uh, you, you, you can dock the cell phone into a, a docking station, and then a, it looks like you've got a regular home phone, a cordless home phone, answering machine, and all that stuff, but it's tied to your cell phone. There's no way, if you think about it, you know, maybe you're thinking a walkie-talkie or some sort of a radio solution that she would have in her house. The transmitter she would have to have to do that <laughs> would be really significant, you know. I mean, there. I guess there are walkie-talkies with my, many miles ranges, and so I guess you could do it with a walkie-talkie solution, but I don't think that's a good alternative. And, of course, as soon as you get out of range, your phone no longer works. Take a look at going the other direction. Frankly, that's what most people are doing. I think fewer and fewer people are subscribing to landline phone service. We, we, you know, so almost everybody carries a phone in their pocket wherever they are. What do you need a different phone for your home? So if you if you want a you know like a feels something that feels like a wired phone, you can get a base station you'd plug that smartphone into. But uh, I don't think you'd want to go the other direction. I, I mean, I'm. I, it's the only technology I, I can think of is a kind of a walkie-talkie technology, but that's not going to go more than a couple of miles. Now, if you're an amateur radio enthusiast, there's, there's solutions out there. Maybe she was a ham. You <laughs> you can do that. Um, <laughs> hams often carry what they call handy talkies with them that broadcast uh, over the ham bands, but you have to be licensed to do that. But if you have a handy talkie, oh, there's all sorts of things you can do. 
if you're an amateur radio enthusiast. I think the best thing to do is get a cell phone. Let, you have to pay a subscription fee, but you have to do that for a landline anyway. And I tell you, I don't think anybody under 25 is ever going to get a landline ever again. Are you listening? Let me, let me ask you, are you under 25? Do you have a landline? No, I'm not talking about mom and dad. They may have a landline. I, I don't even think my kids understand the difference. Like they come home and they're not going to, when they rent their first apartment, they didn't get it. They don't get a, a landline. Well, I got a phone. What do I need a landline for? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. Our show today brought to you by IT Pro TV. You're a geek. I know you're a geek. You're listening to this podcast, right? You love technology. Maybe you're interested in a career in technology. It's hard to get that first job, isn't it? Because you don't yet you have experience, but you don't have professional experience. It's your first job in IT, after all. That's why they have this certification program where you you take a test and you study and you learn about a particular area of IT. There are many, many certs. But I'll tell you the best place to go to learn the material you need to take the practice exams to prepare yourself for a lucrative, satisfying job in IT, it's IT Pro TV. Tim and Don have been IT trainers for more than a decade. They created IT Pro TV as a fun and engaging way to learn the skills you need to get a job in this demanding business. But the good news is there are a lot of jobs open right now. More than a million IT security jobs open right now. You love this stuff. Why not make it a living? Go to itpro.tv slash techguy for your chance to sign up and try IT Pro TV today. 3,300 hours of binge-worthy on-demand training. Uh, more than 100 hours created new each week. You can watch live. You can chat in the chat room just like we do. Uh, and stream it everywhere. They have a Chromecast app. They have a iOS, Android app. They have Fire TV, Apple TV. Very nice Apple TV app, by the way. Roku. You can uh, watch it on your big screen TV. You can wa listen on the go in the car. You can watch at home, at work, on your computer. You can even download courses for on-the-go learning. Skip the boring voiceover slide snooze fest of most IT training and empower your team with interactive IT training. They'll actually enjoy watching at itpro.tv. Go to itpro.tv slash techguy. Use the offer code TG30. You'll get seven days free. And 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your active account. Premium subscriptions, which include unlimited transcender practice exams and virtual labs. I think a very fair $857 a year, but use TG30. You'll only pay $600 a year when you go to itpro.tv slash tech guy. That's the offer code TG30. Flexible training, binge-worthy content, ROI proven. itpro.tv slash tech guy. Don't forget that offer code tg 30, 90,000 IT Pro TV members now. Most of them, I think, watch our shows. <laughs> Thank you, Tim and Don. ITPro.tv slash tech guy. Use the offer code TG30. Yeah, it's absolutely worth it. The, tr the transcender exams alone are $99 a year. And practicing the test before you take it is a great way to do it. We have a lot of our uh, listeners are at IT Pro TV. A lot of them. I know because I went to their opening party in uh, Gainesville of the new studios and they were all, everybody said, say hi to Steve. <laughs> Both people in IT and people who want to get into IT. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. Smartphones, smart watches, all that tech right here on this one show. All you have to do if you have a question or a comment or a suggestion is call me, 8888-ASK-LEO. Holiday, so that usually means on a holiday weekend the phones are a little slow. Good time if you've been trying to get in in the past and couldn't get through the busy signals. This would be a good time to call 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S., or Canada. Outside that area, you can still use Skype and it should be toll free. Website, techguylabs.com. That's free. No sign up. And everything we talk about on the show is there. Lots of links and information. Techguylabs.com. Let's go back to the phones. Line four, Ray in Homosassa, Florida. Hello, Ray. Hello, Will. Thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. You bet. 
I tried to call many times. Uh, however, you know, you're a very successful, busy guy. <laughs> and today... I, I fooled you, I guess, huh? <laughs> <laughs> today I was listening to you. I listen to you almost every time it's on. But anyway, uh, today I was listening to it and uh, listening to the program, and uh, you made a comment that you were surprised that uh, anybody was calling in today, and I thought, gee, this might be my chance. It is. It worked. <laughs> Woohoo! It did. It worked. You yeah. didn't even have to use Siri to call. You just did it. <laughs> no. Uh, that's way above my tech grade. <laughs> I don't have it. Uh, listen. Uh, I have a problem, an ongoing problem uh, that's been go ongoing. When I say ongoing, I'm saying uh, two months. I have a Chromebook, and it's a uh, it's the latest one. I think I've had it. Uh, I don't know, three or four months. Yeah. Uh, I also have a uh, online bank account. I don't know if you want me to mention the name of the bank. Oh, I don't care. We don't have to keep it a secret, particularly. Um, but you, but okay, well, it's it, it, is it a well known is, is it a well known bank? Oh, yeah. Capital One. Okay, Capital One. Like them, they're they're a sponsor, so I'll say nice things about them. Oh, really? I yeah. didn't. Know, I didn't realize. Their that. their okay. credit card is because they have a, a virtual numbers system, which I really think is great, and I'm glad to spread the word about. Where you don't you don't use your main credit card number online, you use the virtual one. It's with that um, that uh, bot they have called Eno, but that's neither here nor there. So you say you have a Chromebook, you have a Capital One yeah. account, and what's going? You can't you can't log in. Okay, I, yeah, I uh, I have a an investment account there, which is uh, separate, and then I have a bank account, savings and checking. Okay. And um, <clears throat> here's the problem. I everything works okay. Uh, you know, I'm I'm saying there's there's nothing that doesn't work as far as implementing what I wanted to do. I have direct. Uh, deposit there. I have uh, payments that are made uh, through there automatically. All my, I, I travel some, and uh, so I don't ever want to worry about it. And I have everything up pretty much on automatic payment. Now, two months ago, thereabouts, I cannot change or access my checking account or savings account online. What happens? Well, it, it, <laughs> you know how it comes up and says uh, not uh, uh, passwords, not a. Uh, it doesn't recognize your password. And it, and it, what it does, and the, the frustrating thing about this is, <clears throat> is that I've been going through this with the company. You know, with the bank, with the representing people, with the tech people, with everybody. And uh, what it does is it loops me back and keeps looping me back. Now, what, so, so uh, let me let me cut, kind of cut the chase here a little bit. So, you you go online and you do it in your Chromebook. So you're using the browser Chrome and 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 you and you enter your name and your password, and you're sure that that's the correct name and password. And then what happens? Does it say that's not right? Yes. yes. And then yes. uh and then you call the bank, you call Capital One, and you say I can't log in, and then they reset your password, right? Right. And then you got the new password and it still won't let you log in. Uh, sometimes it will let me log in uh once or twice. But that's it. Then it gets reversed back. So you're a good candidate uh, and I would turn this on for what Chrome calls autofill. Most browsers do this, and generally, I don't recommend uh, using it because, um, well, it's it's not quite as secure as using LastPass or some sort of password manager, which I strongly prefer. But I don't get the feeling that you're going to be using a password manager. And frankly, if this is you know mostly what you're doing, Ray, is banking, it and and because you're on a very secure platform, a Chromebook, I'm going to suggest you turn on Chrome's. Uh, password memorization feature because then when you type it correctly once it'll it'll remember it and from then on uh, it'll type it for you my guess is that there's some key or something that's not 
maybe it's a, a strange to enter it, or maybe it's, it's you're typing L and it wants a one. That's a really common one. In fact, when I use my password manager to generate passwords, I always say, don't use any characters that are ambiguous, like L and one and O and zero. I probably shouldn't say this out loud because it narrows down the total possible passwords I could be using. You never want to do that. But in this case, I'm not too worried But <laughs> cause, because my passwords usually are very, very long and very, very confusing and not memorable. That's why I, you use a password manager. I'm going to say get use a password. And in if you go into Chrome and you go into the settings section, this is true of every browser, but since you're on a Chromebook, I know you're using Chrome. Every browser will have a way to remember passwords. In this case, it's under the advanced tab. So you go to the very bottom of the settings page. You, you click that three dots in the right-hand corner and you, and you select settings. And you go to the very bottom of that page, you'll see advanced. You open that up. And if you scroll down even a little bit, little bit more, you'll see a, a area that says passwords and forms. And then under that manage passwords. And you can turn on there's an on-off switch right at the top, the ability to ma remember passwords. If you turn it on, it'll offer to remember a password the next time you type it, and you won't have to type it again. And it's my guess that that's what's going on here, that you've got a password that's that it's hard to get right. And, of course, banks, as they should, are very cautious. If you enter a password incorrectly more than once, sometimes they'll just say, uh, yeah, well, you better call us. They don't want bad guys to attempt to log in many times guessing a password so ray I, that's my suggestion is and, and, and for everybody else it really it's a good idea uh, you can use the password manager in the browser to remember passwords and that's fine especially if the password manager is password protected itself you know and yours is because you're on a chromebook you can't get in without a password in your chromebook uh but my stronger, my strong suggestion for almost everybody is to, to get a password manager. For one reason, it goes across machines. You can have it on multiple different computers, and it can be on your smartphone, too. Uh, the one I use is it happens to be a sponsor, but uh, I've been using it for many, long, many, many more years than they've been a sponsor. They're a brand-new sponsor on the shows. Um, it's called LastPass. But there's one password. There's many, many different companies that make these password vaults. Any of them would be better than no password vault. LastPass is my personal favorite. It keeps these passwords safe. You still have one password, the password you use to log into your password vault, but everything else is automatically filled in. And because of that, you can use much longer, much more random passwords, better passwords, because you don't have to remember them. The password vault does. So for you, Ray, just turn on the password manager in Google Chrome and let it remember the passwords. For everybody else... Probably worth, you know, checking in a password manager. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Happy Easter and happy April Fools. And those haven't come together uh, since I was born, I think. More of your calls right after this. Hey, Christopher. Hello. Welcome back. Ah, good to be back. Are you? Are I saw those pictures. Just looking at those pictures made me cold. Uh, <laughs> All the ice. Oh my God! You would have enjoyed it. So, so that's that's the one thing I want to talk about today is the Arctic adventure, the photography there, some of the videography, pictures of ice. Um, well, pictures of ice and doing working with cameras and ice and how to work around some of the nice. issues. Do you there. have some pictures you want me to do a show? I just sent you an email Not with good. a bunch of links. Um, one to a video playlist because I did like a little short. Okay. Uh, Video documentary. Fun, fun, fun. I'm not calling. It, I'm not calling it a vlog, but something along those lines. And it was fun, and it, it was you had a good time. It, it was, was amazing. It was it was so amazing. Oh, it was such wow. a wild ride. Literally, I mean, we were out on the open sea. I'll I'll tell you when we're oh, on. Oh man! On the air. All right. It's kind of fun for me anyway. I don't know what you know. I really wonder what twenty somethings are thinking when they see this movie Ready Player One and they hear all this great. 80s music that they never heard they i guess they wouldn't know what they're hearing but boy for people of a certain age people born in the i guess the 70s or earlier it's really fun it is really fun my wife and i are sitting in there and we're rocking out to the, <laughs> to the music leo laporte the tech guy 8888 
Ask Leo the phone number. Line one is Josh in Sutter, California. Hey, Josh. Hey, hey. How's it going, Leo? It's going great. How are you? Yeah, doing well, my friend. <clears throat> what can I do for you? Hey. Okay, so I have this lovely QNAP uh, NAS server here. Yep, those wow. are great. I love the QNAPs. Oh, yeah, okay, it's wonderful. <clears throat> and um, so I have two six terabytes in there right now, and I have two. It's a four four bay setup. And last night I get a, a notification from Amazon that uh, you know it's National Backup Day or or something like that, and they have the special on uh, some other brand of hard drive, a Toshiba, where I have uh, Western Digital in mine. And I'm like, I'm rattling my brain. Do do I do I go for this deal, the Toshiba six terabyte, or do I go back and do I get a, a, a Western Digital four terabyte to put in there? You know, just so. What do you think about mixing different brands of hard drive? Perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. There are only a couple of hard drive companies left. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but if you look at failure rates, uh, I'll tell you, the the real issue to me is to is it's better in a NAS to get a, a NAS drive, a drive that's designed not necessarily for speed. Most NAS drives are 5,400 RPM, but designed for low heat and long lifespan. But I'm sure if that's, you know, if it was their world backup day offer, that's ex yeah. ex exactly what that was. Um, I'm looking at um, reliability studies. Uh, and, you know, a number of companies have done these. Uh, Google has. Of course, they use more hard drives than anybody. Um, uh, this is a uh, uh, an article from last November in Make Use Of, which is a good site, makeuseof.com. And they're talking about, uh, actually, it's really the, uh, I think the, um, the review comes from Extreme Tech, which Extreme Tech, which is a great site from Ziff Davis, does a uh, annualized hard drive failure report. And the most reliable hard drives, according to that, number one, Western Digital Red, which is probably what you're already using. There's, that's a NAS-oriented hard drive. The next yeah, is the Toshiba. Uh, it's uh, number is MD zero four ABA four hundred V, but then HGST, which are a lot of people really like the uh, uh, HGST drives from uh, is it Hitachi Backblaze uh, uses those, and those are very good. And then Seagate, and then Western Digital Black. But as far as the notion of mixing them, no problem. Oh, good. If oh, the QNAP is using traditional RAID, uh, then remember that your RAID array can only be as big as uh, the the smallest drive in it times the number of drives. So, there, they, right. you know, right. but but QNAP may be. I know many most uh, most uh, companies now use beyond you know some different kinds of RAID that allow you heterogeneous drive collections in there. So that's just something yeah, to be yeah. aware of. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. for. Uh, Don't worry about it, in other words. Eat. Take advantage of the yeah. deal. Happy Easter. <laughs> you had a little <laughs> Easter egg in your mailbox. I didn't mention it yesterday. It was World Backup Day. I'm surprised Carbonite didn't didn't uh, ping me and say, hey, mention this in the ads or something like that. But, yeah, yesterday was World Backup Day. And it's good to read these um, roundups. I uh, Backblaze, which is another uh, competitor, actually, to Carbonite, backup company, uh, had a report from its uh, 2017 hard drive uh, use. They had 10,000 hard drives that they tested. They said enterprise drives have a 1.61% failure rate over 300,000 days. Consumer drives, 1.60 failure rate over 420,000 days. In other words... There was no statistical difference between enterprise drives and consumer drives, which may indicate it's not worth spending the extra money for a so-called enterprise drive. It's hard to parse all the data. Extreme Tech has an article from uh, last month that's probably worth reading. Who makes the most reliable hard drives? They refer to the uh, Backblaze report as well. And, uh, you know, they've, they've kind of narrowed it down and so forth. I'll have to, you know, one of the things Extreme Tech says is you take the usual grain of salt on this. <laughs> so my, my, my basic impression is, and you'll hear people, everybody has an opinion on this one. If you go to Reddit or the forums or you read even in our chat room, and 
One guy will say, oh, you got to use HGST. No question. Oh, that's nuts. Western Digital Red. That's the only. Uh, people will fight over this. It's kind of my guess uh, that they're all pretty much the same nowadays. But occasionally you'll get a blip. Western Digital had a bad batch it's about five years ago. And people to this day still say, I'll never use Western Digital again. But it's not. <laughs> You know, they, they, these companies are constantly improving the product. I wouldn't worry about it too much. I don't think it matters. 8888 Ask Leo. You could disagree with me. The easiest way to do that, either call or go to our website, techguylabs.com. We take comments there, and we're always welcoming your thoughts, even if they if even if they are, Leo is so wrong. I happen to know the best hard drives in the world are X, Y, Z. Because all of that's, you know, valuable, good to have. Guess who's back? He was sailing. <laughs> Crazy person. He was sailing up in the north, up by the North Pole. It's winter, isn't it? Yes, it is. He was he was sailing on a sailing boat up in the Svalbard area. Took some amazing pictures, mostly of ice-coated things, including himself. He's back, our photo guy, Chris Marquardt, with photo tips for photography in extreme temperatures. <laughs> I'm thinking really, really cold. So stay tuned. That's coming up in just a bit. We welcome uh, we welcome uh, Chris Marquardt back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'm going to call him the crazy German. It's time for Chris Marquardt's photo segment. And we've been looking, and you can do it too, at video from his most recent adventure, Hello, Chris. How are you? Hi, Leo. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, wow. You sailed to okay, so 78 degrees north. Yes, that, that was that was the plan, and that's what we did. So um, let, let me let me step back a little. Um, last year in May, we chartered a ship, a two-mast schooner. It, uh, it sailed around Svalbard, which is the archipelago at 78 degrees north. It's... Um, it's it's amazing. It's cold, of course, because in this because it's in the Arctic, and um, I just got to know the owners a bit better. And when and when they sailed from northern Norway up to Svalbard, which they do once a year, and then uh, after six months they sail back down, um, the opportunity came up for me to join them. Uh, so I did, and, and it was not a photo tour. It wasn't a, not a cruise. It was. Pretty much, I was pretty much a part of the crew there, and we sailed up from the north of Norway, from Tromsø up to Svalbard, um, to 78 degrees north, and that means we had to go through uh, the open sea, to, through the Barents Sea, and it took us about three days to get uh, to get through there, and we had pretty strong winds, gale force winds, which means the ship was. Leaning to the side quite a bit, quite a bit, because the winds came from east and we were going straight north, so it was kind of a ninety degree you understand. wind coming up. This is people, many people's, mine included, nightmare. This would I, I totally understand. For me, it's one of those experiences, one of those adventurous experiences that I don't want to miss. And it, it you know, you know, I I kind of like putting myself in a situation that I can't easily get out of, so I have to pull through, and that kind of helps me. I don't know. It. I mean, uh, honestly, yes, of course, there were a few cold moments in there uh, at these winds, especially having like a watch in the night because we had to be out there um, steering the ship and watching out for icebergs and things. Um, so that wasn't always super fun. But then you go back into the ship. It's nicely heated. It's warm. You can charge your batteries. You can have a cup of coffee, a, a tea, maybe even a whiskey. You know, it's 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 a wonderful a mixture of 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 adventure, of camaraderie. You get really close with the people on the ship. Oh, I bet you do. I bet you do. Um, well, but yeah, you know, we have everyone has their own cabin, uh, their own showers, and everything. So it wasn't it wasn't it was not uncomfortable. Did you get all. any photography in or was it all? Well, that, that was the goal. <laughs> that was the goal. Well, I had three goals. The first goal was, of course, to be a good member of the crew to help uh, get the ship yeah, up there. Yeah, because you weren't a tourist. Which, you were actually, you were working. Point, yeah, exactly. It, I was I was, I was. was working. We were packing the ship initially. Then we were three days at sea. Then we were unpacking the ship, getting it ready for, for the next tourist group because that's how they how they make their money. They they. Then that's how I got to meet them. They have tourists on the ship, so we prepared that. But yeah, the, that's, that was the first goal to get up there. The second goal was 
to get some video footage from that. I wanted to do a video documentary. It was not a photo tour. I didn't have any any clients with me. So we were eight, uh, nine people in total on the ship. And uh, so the videography was really important. And that that was successful. I, I ended up making a little seven part video ser- series that I've put up on uh, YouTube. And, and you have the links to that. So whoever's interested uh, in yeah, we've been, wa- we've been watching those. it. What's the YouTube channel? Um, Chris Marquardt, Chris M A R Q U A R D T. Okay, so you should be able to go right to that, and th- those are really fun to watch. I'm also we're looking at the I'm looking at the pictures you brought back. You've well, got some so, great still images too. So the videography was 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 my first production priority, so to speak, and I had I, I had I had an elaborate setup, an external microphone, and my 7D Mark II with the right lens, and a and a. a, 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 a What's it called? Gorilla Pod under it, like a real vlogger setup, you know, a YouTuber setup, and that was just so not feasible with the wind, with the weather. Oh, the really? Cold. So oh. I pretty much stayed in the cabin. Um, but I also had like a little GoPro type uh, action camera, and that that ended up being one of the main cameras that I used because that's easy, easy, it's, easily it's, fits in the pocket, was reasonably waterproof. And, it's basically the Blair Witch Project, but instead of spooky stuff, no, it's, it's freezing <laughs> stuff. Then you're in the cabin going, it's a little cold out there and the no, wind's no, no, no. blowing. It, <laughs> hey, but the, but the ship has central heating. It was beautiful, nice, and cozy and warm. I know, I'm amazed so. you would leave the inside. Uh, they, <laughs> well, it got if, covered if you, with if ice. You have a shift. If you have a shift, the, the ship at one point was actually cover, covered in ice. We had uh, with wind chill about minus seven Fahrenheit oh. at one point. Wow. Which was really cold. Really cold. Um, and then, of course, my third priority was the photography, the the still photography. Yeah. And I had my usual setup, my DSLRs. I'm still a DSLR shooter, didn't bring mirrorless for this one. I uh, had my typical set of lenses, one long lens, a 70 to 300 with four uh, yeah, for the longer shots and my 24 tilt shift. That's my go-to lens you, for wide-angle photography. You use a uh, Canon 5D uh, Mark IV, I think, right? That's that's is one that of the two cameras. Is that weather sealed? Is that designed for this kind of extreme weather? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It, it is. It is at least splash proof, so uh, no problems there whatsoever. Um, also, temperature-wise. The batteries, okay, this was not far out away from power sources. There's a there's a regular power outlet in the cabin, so I was never further away from, from electricity than maybe half a minute. So it wasn't really a big deal, so I could always charge. But even with that, uh, at least the original batteries, the, the manufacturer's batteries, phew, no, no issues with those whatsoever. So um, they worked really well even in those temperatures i think minus seven fahrenheit is a bit under what they uh what they tell you you where you should use the camera but hey um i i i tend to get pictures <laughs> this this way that other people don't get because i kind of sometimes go over those no i'm not no no now is there an issue with condensation when you go from the cold outside into the warm damp air of the inside there is condensation, and of course, if you have a camera uh, at these temperatures and, and it's nicely cooled through, and then you get go inside, um, there will be condensation. It was never an issue, though. Uh, it wasn't. It, I wasn't coming in and trying to take pictures right away, so it took maybe 10, 15 minutes for the camera to just uh, warm up a bit, and then the condensation would go away. So I that's didn't encouraging, even... though. That, I mean, that that means yeah. that camera handled it very well. I I was going to bring the uh, Canon 5D to uh, Antarctica when we went. Uh, no and problem. Pe- pe- at yeah, all. yeah, people. Yeah, it wasn't as cold. It was summertime. But uh, oh, true. Yeah, yeah. People were still saying, "Well, you got to worry. You got to be careful. You don't want to go from mm-hmm. hot to cold and cold to hot. That can kind of cause problems." It sounds like you you sailed through it like a champ. And boy, your it, pictures it, it didn't are cause great. Problems. I I do have I do have two pieces of thing I, I do two pieces of equipment with you with me all the time though, and one is a shower cap like like you find in a hotel room. <laughs> okay. Well, you can you can put this if, if there are splashes of water coming over over the over the board uh, and and splashing onto you, you can protect your camera this way. Just pull that over; it doesn't take oh, up okay. any space. That's a good the idea. The other one is a microfiber cloth, like one yes. you would find yeah. in a kitchen kitchen cloth. Simple, yeah. Yeah. cheap. Uh, get them in a grocery store in a five pack for a few bucks. Um, those microfiber cloths can 
pick up water really quickly. So if the camera gets wet, you can wipe it down. If the lens gets foggy, you can wipe it down. And then if that cloth is wet, it'll dry in almost no time. So you you have it ready to go within minutes again. So that's that's the two pieces of equipment that belong in a pocket in extreme conditions. And what what was the problem with shooting with the um, the seventy and the and the tripod? Was it just too windy and and the boat was oh, tossing we, we too had, much? We had we had wind up to wind force eight, which is gale force winds yeah. and the wind Jeez. coming from 90 degrees. So the ship oh, was leaning man. on the side and oh. it wasn't really f well. And then it was it was it was moving quite <laughs> a bit. Crazy. So it wasn't really feasible to to uh, to put the tripod Go somewhere. Go to uh, been discover, overboard. <laughs> discover the top floor dot com. Find uh, Chris's pictures, his videos, his trip to Svalbard. And uh, he'll be back next week with more wonderful photo advice. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Wow. Wow. Beautiful pictures, though. You can see why uh, National Geographic sends, sends their people into places like this, because you get just amazing pictures that nobody's nobody else is getting, right? You know? Oh, by, by the way, the uh, Svalbard is also an amazing location to do a vacation. You can you can go dog sledding, you can go snowmobiling, you can there are saunas, you can you can go hiking. There are glacier caves. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to see out there, yes. and a lot of stuff. If you like the snow, if you like the cold, uh, highly recommended to go there. I don't like the cold. It was, uh, it was, well, uh, it was it, when I got up, what? it was 48 degrees and I said, Lisa, we're moving somewhere warmer. <laughs> you know, you know, when I was, I was cheating a bit though, because when we had those watches and I was out oh. on the wheel uh, holding the course, um, I had hand warmers in my, in my ah, gloves. Good idea. So little, little chemical hand good warmers thinking. to, uh, to keep me from freezing in too much. And you that was have, good. You, I love it. You have a whole blog uh, post, a bunch of posts about it uh, as well on your blog. So that's cool. ChrisMarkWart.com. Yes. Wow. Really neat. Really neat. <laughs> all 80s all the time. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> Another song from uh, Ready Player One's soundtrack. All those 80s songs. Back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo. Back to the phones. We go line three, Neil, Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, Neil. Hello, Leo. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Great. Um, well, happy Easter, first of all, and thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. Happy oh. Easter. Yeah. yeah. We talked a couple weeks ago, and just so you know, I actually got that saw the uh, streaming problem solved by going to YouTube, so that works great, by the good. way. Good. Yeah, YouTube is a good streamer, so I'm glad that works for you. Yeah. Now, the question I had is this. I ended up trading up my iPhone 8 Plus to an iPhone 10. All um, right. And I took the 8 Plus. And that's not, that's not really the question, but it does bring up a, an issue here, which is simply, or a question, which is, should I be using Wi-Fi calling rather than normal cell service if it's available to me? Um, well, the cell company would like you to do that. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. T-Mobile offers it. Uh, I'm not sure who else offers it. It is a capability of the phone itself, but unless your carrier gives it to you as an option, it's not going to make any difference if the phone can do it. Uh, I have Verizon, and they offer it. And they do offer it. So you could, if you think about it, you can imagine why Verizon might like it. It doesn't use their cell towers at all. It uses your Internet access to make a phone call, uh, which uh, eliminates congestion for them. And good news, they can still charge you <laughs> by the minute. Uh, you might or might not want to use it. It doesn't. Uh, it's going to go against your own bandwidth of wherever you are, whether you're at work or at home or at a coffee shop. It's going to count against that bandwidth. Nowadays, I don't think that's a big issue for most people. We have so much bandwidth. If we have bandwidth caps, that it's not going to be a big deal. Quality could vary. If you're on a poor connection, you'd rather be on the cell phone. Because that the the standard for uh, audio quality on the cell phone is consistent, pretty much, less so on Wi-Fi. So, be, but if you're at home and you know your Wi-Fi is good, the call should sound good. And in some cases, I don't know about Verizon. I know with T-Mobile, sometimes my Wi-Fi calls sound spectacular because uh, T-Mobile is uh, using more bandwidth than they would normally use. The whole phone well, system. Sound, I'm on the Wi-Fi right. I'm on I'm on cellular right now as I talk to you. Just as a comparison. Yeah. So you're on cellular right now. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, your Wi-Fi might sound better. You should try it and see if you sound better. If you do, that would be the maybe the one argument for doing that. Mostly this is to benefit the cell companies. It would benefit you also if you had a weak cell system, you know, a weak cell signal where you are. Uh, you know, the Wi-Fi signal might be better. We have, for instance, uh, you know, uh, many of the my employees have T-Mobile. I use T-Mobile, and there's no T-Mobile signal inside our offices here. Uh, so we have uh, we got from T-Mobile a special device that converts, you know, that so basically becomes a Wi-Fi tower, a cell tower with Wi-Fi access, and so we don't even have to have uh, Wi-Fi calling to use it. It just looks like a cell tower, but it's really just using our Wi-Fi, and that gives us you know lots of uh, what looks like cellular bandwidth inside the uh, studio. So. You know, and that's a case where Wi-Fi calling might be of value. I, you know, I think the only benefit really is, you know, the strongest benefit is to the company because they're not paying for cell bandwidth. But if you see it sounds better or if it works better for you in, in some locations, go ahead and use it. Get it? Thank you very much for the call. Yeah, my Thank pleasure. Thanks for the question. It's a, it's a great question, actually. Uh, you know, I, unless somebody can tell me a reason why you, it's better for you, I think it really the reason they offer it is it's better for the company. Is there is there any reason you could think of it if you have a poor signal I guess and and if if I don't think Verizon does this actually I think Verizon sounds the same the whole you know the whole quality of your phone calls is very low isn't it and it goes back to the time that Ma Bell set up phone service in the United States I mean we're talking 100 years ago and they wanted to figure out what's the lowest quality we could use and still be intelligible and it turned out to be very low quality. It, it wasn't digital. It's analog, so I can't, it's not, you know, 4-bit or 6-bit, but it's about comparable to 4-bit sound. It's very low quality. You know, phone calls are like this. And, but what the engineers figured out is, well, um, the, the human ear is pretty good at distinguishing what, what somebody's saying if they, if they sound like this. So we're going we're gonna to use that quality. And that all makes sense back then. But here we are nowadays with much, you know, un basically unconstrained bandwidth, especially if you're on Wi-Fi. Calls could sound really good. They could sound at least as they good as as good as they do on Skype. Skype's a good example. Uh, you know, Skype. If you have a lot of bandwidth on both sides of the call, you sound like you're in the same room. Chris Marquardt. We just talked to him. He's in Germany, and and we're talking in real time. It sounds like he's in the studio. Studio quality over Skype. He's got a good microphone. I have a good microphone. We both have lots of bandwidth, so it's ideal Skype conditions. But Skype doesn't have that artificial limitation. But I have to say, when you use Wi-Fi on a cell phone, in some cases, they still limit it to really that kind of low bandwidth sound because that's what people are used to. And it is a little disorienting. My, uh, my daughter and I both have Wi-Fi calling on T-Mobile. We both use it at home. And when she calls me, she sounds so much better than on the phone. And at first, it's like, whoa, are you here? Are you in the room? And then I eventually go, oh, oh, oh that's Wi-Fi calling. Lou, Los Angeles. Hello, Lou. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Hope you're having a happy. I'm a having a happy. I hope you are having a happy. Well, only one thing is standing between me and eternal happiness, and that <laughs> getting Microsoft to leave me the heck alone. <laughs> I've, got, uh, I've, got three, I've got three Acer Switch 10s, the two, uh, they're great little machines. Uh, the two that are on Windows 8 and 8.1, no problem. The Windows 10.1 wants me to update constantly. Won't load an update because there isn't enough space, and it's just a constant struggle. Oh, isn't that a pain? And there's no way to turn that off that I know of. Oh, dear. The reason, uh, I understand Microsoft's point of view here. Uh, mm -hmm. Updates are what protects you from bad guys. In most cases, mm -hmm. the updates, some of the updates are feature updates, but most of the time these days, that monthly update, the patch Tuesday you get, is almost always fixing security vulnerabilities. And it's important not only for you to protect yourself, but if you have a vulnerable computer, it impacts the rest of us because it spreads bad stuff. It attacks other systems, even without your knowledge and certainly without your permission. So it's kind of a, it's a public health measure. I, I've heard it compared to public health, and I think it's kind of the case that it's, it's your duty and responsibility as a computer user to keep your system free from infection, to keep it up to date. And that keeping it up to date is the number one best way to keep yourself safe and the Internet safe. So Microsoft decided, and it's a very controversial decision, not to um, 
let people defer upgrades for more than a period of time. Now, depends on which version of Windows you have. Some versions of Windows will let you defer as long as a year. Most versions of Windows, almost certainly what you got on the Acer Switch, 30 days. So you're going to get it in 30 days, even if you defer it. Now, look in your settings. You can defer it. The sad thing is that Acer, it's not Microsoft's fault. Well, maybe it's a little bit. Sold you a device that can't be updated. And we're seeing that with really low storage devices, you know, 32 gigabytes of storage or less. There's just not enough room. Uh, and I think in a case like that, my, they shouldn't even be allowed to sell that. Because if Microsoft's going to demand updates, you ought to be able to do it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, so Verizon does offer a high-quality uh, Wi-Fi calling. That's good to know. I um, li uh, Nobody, uh, and we used to, Lisa used to be Wi-Fi, uh, Verizon, but nobody recently has been Wi-Fi. I mean, Verizon. <laughs> I'm getting punchy. The Tech Guy podcast brought to you uh, as it has been for a long, long time by the folks from LastPass. Well, they haven't, when I say brought to you by LastPass, I mean, I log in every day with LastPass. We use LastPass Enterprise for the business. In fact, I'm such a believer in using LastPass uh, that I give it, it's one of the benefits we offer as a company to employees. They get a free LastPass account. That's how important it is for your security. If you are right now trying to remember passwords or writing them down or letting the browser remember them, if you're, if you're using the same password on a bunch of different sites or variations, if your password consists of birth dates, dogs' names, children's names, stop the insanity. You need LastPass. There are just too many passwords to remember. And a good password is just not memorable. It's long crazy random stuff alphabetic numeric punctuation lastpass makes managing your personal accounts and securing workplace credentials easy effortless all you have to do is remember one password the last pass you'll ever have to remember that unlocks your password vault from then on lastpass fills in your passwords whenever you need them if you need a new password for a new account it generates stores strong unique passwords not just on your computer, on your browser, but on your mobile device. A different password for every site. It even has a security checkup. So it can make sure that sites that you've used or created passwords for before LastPass are safe too. You know, one, one touch password reset for all of your vital accounts. That's great too. I love emergency access. That's a feature LastPass added that lets you designate somebody in case of an emergency. If you're you know, if you die or you're incapacitated, your wife or your husband or your loved ones can take over your LastPass account. Let me tell you, I know this is something people don't like to talk about, but, you know, I've heard so many stories of people who pass away. No one can get in their accounts. They've lost all bank accounts. Investment accounts are gone because no one knows how to get into them. Or you have to go through all the trouble to get them unlocked. LastPass just does this easily with a very secure system they call emergency access. Family sharing is great, too, and I do that with my family because, you know, we have passwords for our P, you know, our electric bill or our, uh, our, our cable bill. Lisa says, what's the, how do you log into the, I said, no problem. I'm just going to share that with you. It's in her LastPass vault. Sure, she uses it. Everybody I know, everybody in my family, everybody I work with and here at work, we use LastPass Enterprise because it's the password management system for companies of every size all the tools you need to secure your business centralizing control of employee passwords and apps did you know 81 percent of all breaches are caused by bad passwords stop the insanity LastPass protects every password in your business without slowing down your employees and of course it's secure encrypted at the device level with aes 256 to protect man in the middle attacks there's LastPass Premium for personal use, LastPass Families for your entire family, LastPass Teams for teams of 50 or less. At work and at home, fix your password woes with LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Certainly, no doubt about it, it's number one here and has been for years. LastPass.com slash twit. I, I started using it. Steve Gibson actually talked to Joe Segrist, the guy who created LastPass, verified everything works as expected. Now Steve Gibson uses it. You should be using it. LastPass.com slash twit to find out which product is right for you. We thank LastPass for supporting the podcast and keeping the tech guy secure.
Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Get any good Easter eggs today? April Fool's Day and uh, Easter for the first time in 60 two years on the same day. So long before the internet, right? 1956 was the last time Easter and um, April Fool's were on the same day. So this is a red letter day, a, a, a once in a blue moon opportunity for the computer industry to really mess around with you. I think all the, I think, <laughs> am I wrong? It used to be, it was, it seemed only a few years ago that there were April Fool's jokes everywhere. It got, I think maybe it got tiresome because you'd read the news and you wouldn't know what to believe. And Google seemed to spend more energy on April Fool's jokes than their actual services. And I think there must have been at some point a few years ago, a memo that went out that said, all right, knock it off. <laughs> Let's just, it's just another day. Google's April Fool's jokes have been fairly benign since. And, and, and also, uh, I think few. There are a few, but not, not anywhere near, feels like, not anywhere near the number there have been in years past. And here's the good news. You can go and read the news, and, and, and you don't have to look at each article and go, is this true? It is April Fool's. Is this true? We talked about where's Waldo and Google Maps. That's one. That's fun. If you haven't done that yet, go... Uh, Open your Google Maps app on your phone, and you'll see a little Waldo, and you can play the game for some time. The Google Cloud folks announced Google Cloud Hummus. Yeah, you could tell they're not putting the same amount of energy in this this year. That was it. Um, <laughs> that's pretty much it. T-Mobile announced a, a shoe phone, a smart shoe phone in a uh, Converse-style pink, or I guess that's magenta, isn't it? Sneaker called T-Mobile's Sidekicks. Mm -hmm. Now, see, it's a mistake to, to announce that because I think some people would want it. Gaming uh, company uh, Razer announced something they're called Project Venom 2, a nanobot-based upgrade that turns you into gaming hardware. See, I don't mind that because, it's just, you know, you look at that and go, yeah, 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 right, right. Pokemon Go, have you played that today? They're all 8-bit. <laughs> Augmented... Augmented reality from the years gone by. Um, but I'm good. I'm 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 not complaining. Ironically, uh, there was one announcement this uh, April Fools that sounded like an April Fools joke and wasn't. In fact, I I, I don't yet. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm going to mention it because it might be worth trying. A company called Cloudflare. Flare. I like a lot. Cloudflare is a uh, company that kind of provides internet services for large companies they're good uh in fact they've been a sponsor in the past i think they're they're still a sponsor of uh, some of our podcasts announced a new dns service one 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 i was sure this is an april fool's joke but uh <laughs> Their uh, matthew prince their ceo said uh yeah you may wonder why we're launching this on april fool's day well we just thought four ones on 4.1 made a lot of sense. 1.1.1.1 would replace your internet service provider's DNS. That's something that's set automatically in your computer or your router, if you have a, a router. Uh, when you're looking up a uh, an address on the internet, you go to the domain name server or DNS server and say, hey, I want to go to yahoo.com. What number is that? And it's like a phone book, really. Uh, typically, you'll use your internet service providers. That's kind of the default. But 1.1.1.1 is a replacement that you could actually put in. Almost all routers, all computers have a place where you could substitute the default DNS phone book with your own. And the idea is 1.1.1.1 is privacy forward. It would keep your internet service provider from capturing the information it gets from you using their phone book. That's nice. It's possible Cloudflare could add at some point uh, protection from malware or even advertising. DNS really is a powerful tool. If, if an advertising server can't look up its address, it can't serve you ads. 
I don't think they're doing that yet. But I wouldn't be surprised to see something like that. So 1.1.1.1 is, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> as much as it looks like an April Fool's joke, I'm pretty sure it's, it's not. And it uses something uh, that is very good and modern called DNS over HTTPS. It encrypts the data about your web browsing as it goes online. Another nice privacy feature. So they're really focused on privacy uh, when you use 1.1.1.1. And potentially, if it's, if it's a good server and it's working well, it could speed you up as well. DNS servers from your internet service provider sometimes are not the best Sometimes they're a little slow. Although I, I am hearing from some people in the chat room that today 1.1.1.1 is iffy. Is I guess a lot of people saw the story and are trying it out. The good news is 1.1.1.1 comes from Cloudflare, whose business one of whose business is uh, remediating what they call denial of service attacks. They have a lot of bandwidth and servers all over the world. So if anybody could handle an onslaught of traffic, it would be Cloudflare. Any, did you, have you seen any great Easter eggs yourself this year? 8888-ASK-LEO. Or put them up on the website, techguylabs.com. Alan's on the line from Charlton, Massachusetts. Hello, Al Alan. Hey, Leo. How are you? I'm great. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I have never been on the show, but I did see you in Petaluma. Oh, time. Nice, to, nice to talk to you then. Yeah. Um, it, my problem is I'm, I'm working with um, digital photos, and I've got a new PC. I'm trying to copy uh, a lot of photos from one to another. I'm using a, a portable uh, drive I stuck on my main PC. So I've got a uh, HP Spectre, uh, 16 gig of RAM, half gig, uh, 500 gig of uh, SSD on it. It's pretty nice performance. But I'm trying to put photos in there. And the problem is, um, a lot of these photos I have raw and I have regular. I actually have Lightroom on the other PC. Um, and I haven't put it on the new one yet. <laughs> so when I'm putting them on there, it's, it's it's making copies. It's automatically doing too many things I don't want. I, I'm an old school kind of guy. and yeah. love to be able to copy a file and have it go where I just, want just, and not be 50 places. <laughs> just put it in yeah. one spot. I don't blame you. Yeah. yeah. Especially with photos, because especially if you're editing them with Photoshop or as you are Lightroom, then you can have multiple copies of the same photo, which is really annoying. Exactly. And I have many, many of them. And also, because I was helping other people out, I have tons of their photos. Um which is a problem, right? So I have, like, redundant of their own. I don't recognize the photos, maybe some of their family photos. <laughs> yeah, this happens. For a while, I was uh, using a wall desktop wallpaper, downloading it from, I think it was 500px, a website using an automated downloader, and it polluted my entire photo stream with pictures much better than mine. And it was very frustrating because I'm going through my photo stream, all of a sudden these gorgeous landscape photos, I'm going, oh, these are more wallpapers from 500px. i gotta, I got to figure out a way to get rid of them. So there's a couple of solutions that work quite well. Um, of course, there are file deduplicators. I'm, I'm always reluctant to use those because you don't want to accidentally delete originals. But in most cases, uh, a good file deduplicator will find, uh, you know, uh, duplicates and be careful about only deleting real duplicates as opposed to things that look alike. And, and you can often set uh, parameters to determine that. We'll put a list of do duplicators. We've done this before in our show notes. Uh, I won't go through that whole list again. I use Google Photos. You have Lightroom. You might want to use Adobe's cloud services. You have Microsoft Windows. You might want to use OneDrive. Those are great ways to back up as well. They don't have deduplication services, but it's a, I think it's a in some ways a better thing to have copies on the cloud. In fact, you can because many of these services are free. Amazon Prime has free unlimited backup. Google Photos has free unlimited backup. If you're paying for uh, Adobe's Creative Cloud, you get a terabyte of backup, which for most people is sufficient to cover a decade worth of photos. All of these services. Are, are you know inexpensive or free and that means you can back up everything in multiple places and that's very nice too so for deduplication yeah you're probably going to run a run a program to do that and then i guess my suggestion would be to pick a couple of different cloud services and use those for backup keep one copy of originals locally one copy backed up 
you know, off-site and let the services back it up too. And you're never going to lose a photo. And 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 because the storage is virtually unlimited in most of these cases, a few duplicates aren't going to kill you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up right after this. A little green onions for you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo. Put a little green onion in your lot because mm, that's good. John on the line from Anchorage, Alaska. Hello, John. Hi, how are you going? I'm going. great. How are you? Well, we have a nice sunny day. It might hit 40 today, so it's looking good. Oh, oh man. <laughs> and I was thinking how cold it is here in California because it was in the 50s. I'm thinking, I'm so cold. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. I know our daughter was down in Disneyland, and it was bad for them also. Yeah. <laughs> my, problem is, my problem is I had a Wi-Fi problem. Okay. We were on a vacation for two weeks, yeah. and about halfway through, uh, I was getting from my security system over the internet uh, alarm. It was high winds Oy. and blowing snow. Oh. And I got about a 40 of these warnings. Now I finally turned it off and went to bed. Next morning, I turned it on to check it out and nothing. I couldn't log in. And I came up thinking that, well, the wind, high winds, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, knocked out. My Wi-Fi something blew over. Modem. Yeah. Well, no. Well, it knocked it out for maybe two or three seconds. Not enough to reboot. Well, I, I'm wondering what's going on. I call a neighbor. I said um, I can't log in. Uh, can you go up the back of my house, turn my electricity off for thirty to uh, for a minute, so my modem will reboot, which took care of the problem. Oh, very clever. Everything booted. It booted back up my phone because I use Wi-Fi, you know, phone. I have a security, excuse me, a security system, and a temp app because when we're gone in the winter, I like to be able to monitor my temperature upstairs and downstairs. So all that was out of, wasn't working, and I was sort of concerned. <laughs> yeah, you're really dependent on this, uh, especially when you're not there, and and it's the potential right. of pipes freezing and all of that. Yes, yeah, so I just wonder if there's. What could I do in the future if, you know, it goes out and I can't, you know, what keep it from coming back on? Because it was only off. I don't know what the time frame is for rebooting. I think it's about a minute, Jeff. Yeah, but you don't want to always have to call your uh, neighbors, do you? Yeah. So <laughs> then I came up, well, I put one of these light timers on, have it on all day except for, like, 15 minutes in the middle of the night. Every day, <laughs> turn it on and off if I'm on the trip. <laughs> so there are, of course, uh, remote ways to switch power off or on, but all of them that I know of use the Internet to do it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, use the Internet. I can't get to so it. if you can't get to it, uh, rebooting the power, uh, you have to have some other way to reach uh, the uh, power yeah. system. I, am, I imagine there could be telephone... Uh, connected devices. What you might want to do, I think this might be a better solution for you. In fact, I would highly recommend it if power is yeah. an issue, is an uninterruptible power supply. Not You can get whole house versions, by the way. And if mm -hmm. you ask your electrician, uh, it's not as expensive as it might sound because it's really all just at one spot, the junction yeah. box where the power comes in. Uh, and an electrician could put that in. There's a battery pack that'll keep. The, you can get them as big as you know a day's worth of power. Uh, that's going to be more expensive though than getting a standalone UPS that you just plug your Wi-Fi router into. Mm -hmm. The advantage of that is you get. Those, I have one of those old ones that I've had for years for my computer, but I never used it. The battery went bad. It'll go bad every so. uh, year or so. You'll have to replace the battery on these because they're always in use. On a good one, they're always cycling. So, uh, but this, but the advantage of this is twofold. Not only do you have this backup on the Wi-Fi, so even if the power glitches because of a windstorm or whatever, mm -hmm. the, the Wi-Fi will keep working. It also protects the Wi-Fi router and any other electronics attached to it, because most uh, mm -hmm. most of these good ones, and I would recommend getting one that does what we call power conditioning, will uh, okay. your power will run through the UPS. So some UPSs mm -hmm. are failover. The power goes out. They, there's a brief moment of time when the device gets no power, and then the UPS kicks in. That is not as desirable, although it is less expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, what you really want is one that's running the power through the battery all the time. So if the power goes out, it doesn't matter. 
uh, continuous power supply. It will that will also smooth out power spikes, brownouts, and that really is a good idea for sensitive electronic equipment. Uh, actually, low power can sometimes be worse than a power surge. Oh. So with it doing it, then, then there would no be in, no interruption to my. There'd be no interruption, right? You do have to remember that you know you're only going to have a certain amount of power power capacity. That's why a whole house solution will, of course, have big batteries because you're powering a lot of stuff, including your refrigerator. But if yeah. you're just going to power a Wi-Fi router, that sips at power. It doesn't use very much power mm -hmm. at all, and you could get easily get a you know five, six, twenty-four hour. UPS that would just power that small device uh, fairly affordably. Number of companies make oh, okay. these. Yeah, number of companies make these. I've used APCC for a long time. Trip Light, uh, Cyber Power is one that uh, people are really recommending. The the words to look for: Sine Wave UPS that cleans up the power, makes it a clean sine wave, uh, and will also condition it and uh, keep your uh -huh. gear safe. And that'll get you through the. T I think that's. There may be, I wouldn't be surprised, you can ask your electrician if there is some sort of dial-up reboot system that you, you call in. But, of course, the, all the ones I know of are IP-based. They go over the Internet. If the Internet's what's going out, rebooting your house without it isn't going to be po possible. So look at a, a good cyber power, uh, smart UPS, protect the gear, and keep it running. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, I think there's probably phone-based... Let me see. Smartphone-based uh, uh, telephone-based power strip. And you could re yeah, yeah. Here you go. Remote RDU. Bell can make some um, power switch controlled by the telephone. Actually, this is from. Um, I don't know who this is from. Smart power switch designed to control AC outlets through a telephone keypad. The only remote power reboot solution in the market where, when no internet network connection is available. So there you go. And it's not expensive. It's 100 bucks. <clears throat> so it has to have a password, of course. So you call into it. Then you enter the password. And uh, you can use two power. So this would be another way to do it. I'll put a link to this. It's uh, from All About Adapters, the remote PDU power switch. Let me give you, let me put a link in the chat room. I almost would prefer to put, you know, you have the UPS, but on the other hand, um, having both of them might be a great, you know, kind of double solution. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. We're doing the 80s thing. I was, saw Ready Player One yesterday. It's all about 80s nostalgia, a lot of fun, and virtual reality, and sci-fi, and games, and it's a fun show. Really enjoyed it. 8888-ASK-LEO, you know, that's the phone number if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, 888-827-5536, toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, and we are going to keep uh, taking calls after the show today. I should let you know I'm recording ahead. For future episodes, if you can't get through or you want to get through and you're around in about half an hour, uh, this would be a good time to call 8888-ASK-LEO. We'll keep taking calls for another 45 minutes after the uh, show ends. David, Hollywood, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, David. Okay, Leo. What can I do for you today? Leo, uh, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm a disgruntled... Uh, of Alienware uh, 17 R7 laptop owner. Uh, I bought this last year and I used it for about six months. And uh, after that, I was run down by a crazy driver in Hollywood. Oh, and no. almost killed me. And uh, so for the last five months, yeah, almost for five months, uh, I have been using the uh, laptop. And uh, so I started using it uh, like two months ago. And uh, a little bit, because I couldn't see well. And um, and then the computer started giving me problems and more problems. Uh, the uh, motherboard had to change, had to be replaced three times, and still batteries. And then uh, it, now, finally, was it in the accident, or that's unrelated? It's not related. It's just was was it in the accident the though? Computer. Was it in the accident? 
It was not. Okay. It was, not. It was at okay. home. And, Got it. Uh, you so, just stopped using it for a while. I'm glad you're feeling better, by the way. That's good. Well, yeah, I'm in a wheelchair, so... Uh, oh, I'm you know, so I'm, sorry. I'm oh. looking forward to walking on my, my legs again. I bet you are. Anyway, the, uh, yeah, um, the senior's technicians came and checked it out, and it's still not working. I'm looking forward to have it replaced. But one of the uh, SD cards, uh, the first one, I had a bunch of programs there, and the computer was not responding and didn't wipe out the, because uh, they tried to bring it to factory status, but it wasn't able to. So I held on to the card, and I only have 10 days left to, uh, to uh, wipe it out, but I don't know a device that will fit into the SD SSD card, one terabyte, and it's a PCIe generation three by four. So it's in and, the, is it in the computer? Is it inside the computer? Or is it an external it card? It was, it was. Okay, so you want to format the SSD that's in the computer before you send it back to Acer, and I certainly hope they give you a replacement, because uh, that's terrible. Yeah, it should be working, especially it's still under warranty. Good news. The problem is it's very hard to erase an SSD 100%. You probably can get most of what's on there, but the way SSDs work, the, you can't guarantee that every bit of data is gone. Most people, that's not going to matter. Uh, so, you know, just what I would recommend doing is just reinstalling Windows on there and just, you know, erase the drive if you need to beforehand. And that would probably be good enough. If you want to work a little harder... There's a program called D-Ban, D-B-A-N, Derek's Boot and Nuke, that will do the best job possible of erasing it. It's one of those programs that overwrites the data and then, you know, erases it again and overwrites it again. But the problem with SSDs is that they don't work the same way as spinning drives, and there's often some leakage of data on an SSD. So in, but, I mean, look, I, you <laughs> This, this would mean somebody really wanted to get you, and you would have to have the bad luck of putting something uh, on the drive that didn't get erased that really was worth something. I wouldn't worry about it. Acer's not going to do anything with that. For future reference, everybody should understand this. SSDs, whether it's your phone, whether it's your laptop, solid-state disk drives, uh, leak information. It's, it's because of what's called wear leveling on the drive. Data is written in a variety of places, not always in the places the drive expects data to be. You can erase the known file system, but other stuff will always be there. Wear leveling prohibits anything like D-band from getting to every little corner of it. It doesn't leak all of the stuff. Most of the stuff is erased. It's just bad luck if some, you know your password file is somewhere where it didn't get erased. So, but... Every time I use an SSD, every time you use an SSD, every time you get a new phone, the solution for this is before you start using it, encrypt it. Turn on encryption. If you have a file system, uh, operating system that supports encrypted file systems, whether it's BitLocker on Windows, uh, File Vault on Macintosh, just turn it on. The first thing you do, it's part of your setup. On your phone, most phones are encrypted now. iPhones are all encrypted, so you don't have to worry. Uh, Samsung phones. Um, I think they encrypt the internal by default. They do not encrypt the SD card, so turn that on. And the reason is, even though not, it won't be all erased, little crumbs of information will be left behind, they're worthless without the password. So as soon as you reset the machine, start over, it's gobbledygook. It's still there, but it's, you know, it's encrypted gobbledygook. So that's really important nowadays. It's a very different advice from previous days. On spinning drives, you could use something like Darren's boot and nuke to guarantee that the drive was completely erased. It's not true on SSDs anymore. So you really should encrypt right away. That way, nothing that you put on that drive will be there unencrypted. It's useless without the key. And Missing is saying in the chat room something wrong. So I want to say again, even if you boot from an external drive... <laughs> and you run D-Band on an SSD internally, that will not erase everything. The drive is fighting you. This is the problem. The SSD is fighting you. It's using something called wear leveling. The whole idea in an SSD of wear leveling is that no one cell gets written to too many times because they wear out. And so wear leveling pre prohibits, pre prevents a dr erasing program from erasing everything. It won't be able to get to everything. That's just the nature of SSDs, I'm sorry to say. 
I'm sorry about your accident. I hope you're feeling better soon. And I and I do hope Acer takes good care of you. You deserve to have a computer that works, that's for sure. John in West Palm Beach, Florida. Leo Laporte. The uh, Was that John? That was John. Was it? No. Hi, John. Hello. You have a similar problem. Well, kind of, sort of. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about Before it. Before I get to that, uh, I was just watching last week. Well, I want to say I'm not a long-term listener but i discovered you guys like a couple months ago and i've been binge watching like crazy uh all your previous episodes thank you thank you I was, I was just watching last week's podcast and someone was wanting to upgrade from seven to ten and of course the disability thing disappeared where they had the free upgrade yeah and i came across an article on ars technica or one of those that uh said that if you install windows 10 you can still use the windows 7 or 8 key to validate it and as of the time of the article, they said it still worked. So well, that's good news. In other words, Microsoft hadn't really disabled it. They just said exactly. they disabled it. <laughs> exactly. That's really good news. I, I, you know, I why not keep that works. going forever, Microsoft? I think that's a good thing. I don't know if it still works, but that was an article I came across. Anyway, my problem is a couple of years ago, I bought my first SSD from Intel, came with a disk, and, of course, I thought, you know, the disk must have something good on it. So I stuck it in and uh, installed it. And it installed a RAID program on the BIOS of my computer, which I don't need, don't want. <laughs> and there's no way of removing it. I've gone into my BIOS. I've reflashed my BIOS. I've been all over the Internet looking for an answer. And I can't find any way of taking it. It's not it using it, is it? It's just there. It's just there. Right? No, just ignore it. Almost, this is software rate. Almost all BIOSes, BIOSes, or now we call them firmware because there's no such thing as BIOS anymore. It's EFI. But almost all firmware comes with the capability of doing RAID. Don't worry about it. It's not taking up any room that you need. It's not there. It's not being used. Uh, I don't know of any way to get rid of it. I don't know why you'd want to. That's just a feature in the firmware that you're not using. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888 Ask Leo. More calls still to come. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888 Ask Leo. Steve Redondo Beach, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Steve. Hey, Leo. Welcome. Yeah, it was interesting how you were talking about uh, April Fool's jokes with uh, Pokemon Go. There's a lot of players out there that are upset that they went to the 8-bite. Oh, really? They don't like it? It'll go back, I'm sure, tomorrow. It'll go back to normal. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was kind of clever. <laughs> you know, I think that's one reason we're not seeing as many April Fool's jokes. I think it really annoys people. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the chat on the, on Facebook and the groups that I'm in, they, they just don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Stop messing with Pokemon Go. I'm trying to play here. That's pretty funny. So, so anyways, the question I have is I have a RCA Cambio. Uh, it's a two-in-one. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to set it up for a second device now, but I forgot the Windows password. Oh, and no, 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 no. What version of Windows are you on? Uh, Windows 10. Okay. So, uh, in older versions of Windows, forgetting your password didn't make too much of a difference because it really didn't pay any attention to the password. The worst case scenario was Windows 95, where it would just let you in without a password. Uh, that was definitely a security issue. So, uh, They've made it a little bit harder, each successive versions of Windows, to get your password back. Ideally, you know, your password should not be recoverable. Um, there is, it is possible, and I don't know if you did this, to make a Windows password reset disk. But you have to do it before you lose your password. You don't happen to have that. In fact, I think if you did, you wouldn't be calling, would you? No, no, I didn't do that. But that's a, a little lesson for everybody with Windows 10 right now. You might want to, if before you forget your password, you might want to make a password reset disk. So okay. we're going to go to Plan B, which is, by the way, that's the only uh, way to do it that Microsoft recommends. That's their official method. Mm -hmm. Well, you made a password recovery disk, didn't you? Well, no, of course I didn't. I wasn't going to. I wasn't planning on forgetting my password. Did you use your Microsoft account to log in? Uh, yes, I did. Oh, that's easier. 
That's good news. So you've forgotten your Microsoft account password, in other words. Uh, it's just when I turn it on, uh, it asked for the password, and then I typed in what I thought it was, and then that wasn't it. Well, if you I've use, and, and this, yeah, if this is, by the way, always my recommendation. Use your Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows account, not your, so in the old, again, this goes back to the old days. You, you know, it wasn't tied to anything. It was just a password you made up when you set up the computer. Nowadays, when you sign up Windows 10, the default is, what's your Microsoft account? And it'll log you in that way. If that's how you did it, you're golden. You just go to another computer and reset your password. Log, log, go to your Microsoft account on the browser and say, I forgot my password. And it's a normal password forgot you uh, system. And by the way, that works really well. Okay. So yeah, did, you, did, you, did you did you did you do you do you remember that? I mean, it's it's actually hard on Windows 10 not to use your Microsoft password. You have to kind of click around a little bit to use uh, your own password. So, um, did you do that, or do you, do you remember? Uh, no, I know my Microsoft account password. It's not the one you use to log into Windows. No, no. Oh. It was it was uh, totally different. Uh, it was something that was supposed to be real easy to remember, and okay. I hadn't used this laptop in a while. So, so that's, again, I'm going to just say for the rest of you listening, use your Microsoft account password because you can always make, after you create that account, you can always make a pin, you can use a picture, you can, there's all sorts of other ways to log in. You can have a five-digit pin if you want or a three-digit pin. Maybe you have to have four, but you can make a short, easy-to-remember pin. Use that to log in day in, day out. But if you ever forget that PIN, you can use your Microsoft account to get back in. If you only use a local account for Windows 10, then this gets more complicated. So I'm going to take your word for it that you didn't use your Microsoft account. It's kind of hard. You actually actually work at it to not use a Microsoft account login. I take it you didn't create a PIN or anything like that either. No. You know. it, it, when I first set it up, it just said, uh, what do you want to call the, the computer? And what do you want the password to be? Oh, really? When it were you not online, or you, or maybe it wasn't Windows 10 right. when you set it up? No, it was a Windows 10. Huh. That's the way it was bought. And then I tried even doing the uh, factory reset uh, to wipe everything and go back to the day we bought it. Um, I was able to do it only the one time, and now we can't get back into even doing a factory reset. That's weird. Are you sure it's not a uh, hard drive password or something like that? It's not. No, it's, it's the uh, Windows it's, login it's password. Windows, you should be able yeah, to recover. Windows login. Okay. Well, Microsoft does make something um, called the Microsoft Diagnostics and Recovery Tool Set. It's really designed for a business where you know an employee walked out the door and you don't know the employee's password, but you want to wipe the computer and use it again. MS Dart. Uh, you can uh, download it from Microsoft. You're going to make a Dart recovery USB key or CD if you have a CD drive. Most people don't. And in that, there is a what they call the locksmith wizard, <laughs> which does exactly what you want to do. You can reset the Windows 10 password. You don't need to go to any pirate program. Microsoft has a program to do that. There are, not pirate's the wrong word, uh, third-party Windows password unlocking tools. There's PC Unlocker that will also work. I'll tell you what, I will put a link in the show notes to uh, how to, the, the six ways to reset a forgotten Windows 10 password. I'll put that in the show notes right now at uh, techguylabs.com and you can work your way down through the list. It really starts with the best way to do it and, and goes down to the worst way <laughs> to do it. <laughs> MS Dart is, I didn't know about MS Dart until I read this article though. That's a, That's probably a good way uh, to do it, let me look. Microsoft says apparently, if you for, if you uh, forgot your Windows account password, uh, you can't do a recovery. You have to reset the PC. So, if you're willing to lose whatever's on that computer, you can just completely start over by doing a reset this PC. Go to the boot options, troubleshoot, reset this PC, and that's to protect you. That's to protect your data. You, you'll it'll erase the whole hard drive. If you don't mind that. That's also an option. So let's make it seven ways. <laughs> seven ways to get your hard drive back. 
Uh, we are done, at least for the moment. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to keep the calls going. I'm recording ahead for future shows. So if you're on the line, hang on the line. And if you're not on the line, 8888, ask Leo. And we will uh, be taking more calls for another about 45 minutes. Thanks to Michael Cozio for spinning the 80s discs today, our musical director. Thanks to Kim Schaffer for answering the phones. Most of all, thanks to you for joining me. I appreciate it. And I'll see you next time. Have a great geek week. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.